In the Bloom project, we look into new technologies and innovations of the so-called bioeconomy. Bioeconomy is about using renewable resources like plants that allow a more circular dynamic in the production and lifetime of waste of material. It is different than the fossil-based industry, where products made from plastic are produced in a quite linear process. You extract resources, create a product and then generate waste. We are here in a forest near Vienna. In this episode, I will show you the process of how textiles can be made from wood. The shirt I'm wearing is made completely out of wood. Completely, 100%. This is somehow being produced into this, but how, I'm not quite sure. Do you have to cut the wood extremely thin in order to make this? Some of this wood will go to the Lansing Group headquarters. Lansing is a specialist for the eco-responsible production of fibers made from wood. I will ask him to show me around and talk to their sustainability expert, Peter Bartsch. But first, one thing. Do you know what cellulose is? Cellulose looks like this is a linear chain of so... Stop. Let's put that away. Cellulose is very common in nature. It is the main component in the cell wall of plant cells. The strong and sturdy cell walls enable the plant to form, to be protected and remain upright. I'm sitting here in the midst of an enormous pile of wood. Every day around 3000 tons of trees are being processed here. And my initial question is how can you make a shirt out of wood? Yeah, actually it's a good question. It's a long way to do it. What we are doing is we take the wood and wood uh, has different components. One is cellulose, then you have other components like lignin and other parts. And we extract the cellulose and then we convert the cellulose from the wood into fibers. To extract the cellulose from wood, first you have to chop the wood in small pieces and then you have a cooking process to get the cellulose in a very pure form. It is also called pulp. Let's step out of the production for a minute. I will speak with Antje Potthast. She's a professor at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. I will ask her, why is it a good idea to make textiles out of wood? Yeah, today most of our textiles are mainly based on cotton still. But cotton needs a lot of water to grow um, and it needs a tremendous amount of pesticides. A lot of textiles are also made from synthetic fiber like polyester which are produced from oil-based chemicals. But they have the problem that they, at the end of their life or already during the washing, um, generate also what we have now uh, as microplastics. Microplastics have a huge impact on the environment, like the microplastic in water, but the amount of it is shocking. In Europe, the estimated number is half a million tons of microplastic that end up in the ocean every year. Not to use um, uh, oil-based chemical, but to still use a sustainable resource, wood is a good idea. And maybe also relevant is uh, when we talk about uh, the sustainable benefits of the fibers is based on the pulp making technology and the fiber making technology, we can provide fibers with a very good environmental footprint in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of water consumption and so on. Wood uses a lot less water. It needs less pesticides and the fiber made from wood is biodegradable because it is 100% cellulose. So I know where the cellulose is taken from, but how is it transformed into fiber? Yeah, for the fiber making, we use the cellulose from our production. The cellulose looks like uh, paper, it comes in sheet form. And this cellulose is then uh, treated and dissolved you have to make a honey-like liquid out of it. And this uh, you press through a spinneret into a bath and then uh, the cellulose fiber is formed. And this fiber we wash, we clean it and we cut it into the fiber lengths we need and then it looks like a cotton fiber. So we just took a look into this high security factory where we had a chance to see how the cellulose is being processed into the long white webs. It is hot, it is steamy, but it's exciting. 
the method of making fiber out of wood is already more than 100 years old. But what we've seen just before is actually quite new and innovative. The research team here invented a process of fiber making which causes almost no waste, because the chemicals for dissolving the fiber can be used again and again. It's kind of a circular system. Okay, here is this fiber now. I need to see how you can do a textile from that. The fiber is spun into a thin yarn in multiple processes, and for making textiles, this yarn can then be woven into a fabric. Production from sustainable material has a lot of advantages. But is it really enough when we still consume as much as we do now? Growth cannot be unlimited. And one way to deal with that is not just to make sustainable materials, but also to a large extent to save resources. It's important to give maybe the garments again more value, that you appreciate what you wear. So it's about uh, have more long-lasting products, more long-lasting garments. I think this is also a way to more sustainable and more responsible behavior. The use of renewable materials such as wood allows a circular process where waste is integrated into the cycle. I'm quite impressed to see how fabric can be made out of wood and how many steps are actually necessary. So I will definitely appreciate it and keep it for a long, long time. Biomass is everywhere. I am surrounded by all kinds of plants and fields. And all this green nature around me is what we call biomass. In this episode, I'm on my journey to find out how it's possible to use sugar beets as a resource for creating sustainable products. We are at a large field of sugar beets. You might think it's impossible, but here we can use beets to make 3D printed objects that are biodegradable. How can you transform this beet into a chess piece, a vase or a mouth guard for hockey? In the north of the Netherlands, a whole region has specialized in researching and developing how biomass can be used to implement a circular bioeconomy. Not far from here, there is a 3D printing lab. There we will meet Professor Jan Jager. He works at NL Stende University of Applied Sciences and knows a lot about the process of converting biomass into useful everyday objects. I got this bike from Dutch Fiets, a Dutch company who, with the help of Jan Jager and others, made this bike from recycled plastic. Your research is about transforming natural resources like sugar beets into bio-based objects. What is your motivation behind this research? In general, plastics are produced from, from oil. But uh, as you know, uh, the availability of oil will be limited in the future. So there is a lot of work going on, some, some research going on, to develop new, new polymers, new plastics, not based on oil, but produced on biomass. These objects are printed with a normal 3D printer. What is really special about it is that the material used for printing is 100% bio-based. But how is this possible? Jan Jager explained that the first step is the transformation of the sugar beet into the raw material for the bioplastic, called PLA, polylactic acid. But what is PLA? And how is it created? To transform the sugar beet into a bioplastic, first you have to take the sugar from the beet and start the process of fermentation. So the sugar gets transformed to lactic acid. After that, we put the catalyst to the cocktail which lets the molecules stick together in a long chain, also called polymer. Because of these long chains, the material gets stable, like a conventional plastic. Actually, I found out that they don't produce PLA yet in the north of the Netherlands, but that there is a global market for it, which is where the institute buys it for their research. The north of the Netherlands is rich in agro-industry and invests a lot into implement their own regional value chains. Sooner or later, they will be able to source their own PLA from their own local fields. It's an interesting material because it's bio-based, it's produced from biomass. And in addition, it's also compostable. So you can develop new kinds of products where you make use of the compostability of the product. These chips are PLA chips, but on their own, they cannot be used for printing. 
students in this lab are able to turn the PLA pellets into printable filament. From the PLA chips you can easily make uh, filaments, PLA filaments, for 3D printing. And when you have the uh, access to a 3D printer, you can easily use the PLA monofilaments to make all kinds of new products based on the PLA. These chips are introduced to the hopper. Under high pressure they go through the extruder to be cooled down in the water bath. Ah, okay. These long spaghettis are coming out of this machine. Now it really looks like a filament. During my stay in Emmen, I realized that there is much more going on there than just using PLA for 3D printing. More and more companies are popping up using PLA as a basic material for developing all kinds of bio-based products. One of the companies developing applications from PLA and other biopolymers is Sembis Polymer Innovations. They produce bio-based yarns for the horticultural sector. This bio-based yarn, for example, can be used in horticulture to grow tomatoes in greenhouses. After harvesting the tomatoes, the yarn can be composted together with the leftover leaves and stems of the tomatoes. This saves work, time and money, as the yarn doesn't have to be sorted out separately. We call us the, the, the green area. Green area where bio-based products, the development of bio-based products is the focus. So we work close together, we have students, where we do applied research together with the companies in this area. Is bio-based the same as biodegradable? No, it's not. Bio-based means that something is made from renewable resources like plants. Biodegradable, instead, means that the material will disintegrate into nature when you compost it. After the lifetime of a PLA product, there are three different options. If it is biodegradable, you can compost it under specific conditions. Then there is the possibility to recycle it, or you can burn it, which should be the last option. I learned biodegradable does not mean I can throw it into nature, because it still needs a lot of time to disintegrate, and could still harm the environment. Nearly every plastic today could be replaced with bio-based materials. But if we need natural materials like sugar beet to produce PLA, are we not wasting an incredible amount of food and land for the manufacture of consumer products? I went to Wageningen to find out more. At Wageningen Research I will meet Harriette Bos. She is a specialist in bioeconomy and has been working on this topic for over 20 years. Let's see what she says about the use of biomass and if it competes with the land we need for food production. So it's not necessarily bad to use a feedstock that you can eat also for materials, but you have to look at it at the, the complete uh, picture. Even if we uh, would use biomass for all the materials that we use, then it would only be a small percentage of everything that we uh, produce to make our food. So this, this is quite a big difference in, in, in market size, so I think there's room there. And there is no room to do all our transportation based on biomass, because that would be a too much big demand on our feedstock. From your point of view, what would an ideal economy and an ideal world look like? So in the ideal world, we would have uh, crossed out everything from fossil feedstock. Uh, have other uh, uh, energy options such as wind and, and solar etc but also partly based on biomass there where it's not easy to do something on, with solar and wind and our materials are fully made from from biomass so every new material you make is made from a renewable feedstock so no more oil uh, and we do this so efficiently that also in the same time we can also produce our food uh, and, and so this, this everything should run on, on biomass, basically, and that's, uh, yeah, that's a tremendous, uh, uh, I say that, difficult. <laughs> so it's, it's something that we, yeah, that we are working very on very passionately here in Wageningen, but it will take some time. That's all, uh... Wow, this is really a great vision. And for me, the most fascinating thing about it is that in this region of the north of the Netherlands, it is already partly becoming reality. It's unbelievable that this comes from out of sugar beet and I can make my own biodegradable object right here on a 3D printer. So let's start and print it. If you can already print a vase from biomass, imagine how many of our daily projects could get bio-based in the near future.
This episode of the Bloom video series brings us to Kraków in Poland. Did you know that there is plastic made by bacteria? Hmm? But how? Everyone knows conventional plastic. In our daily life it is everywhere. But what would a world be without plastic? The fossil-based plastic production process is quite linear. We pump oil out of the earth, make a product from it, and after using it, it will be thrown away. If disposed of properly, it may be recycled, but for a large part it will be burned. And a lot of plastic that is not disposed of properly ends up in the environment. Wouldn't it be so much nicer if we could use plastic which can be integrated into nature cycles? Actually, this is something that researchers all over the world are working on. Here in Kraków, at the Jerzy Haber Institute of Catalysis and Surface Chemistry of Polish Academy of Science, a so-called bioplastic is being made with the help of bacteria. Bacteria that can make plastic? I did not know that either. And here we are. Okay, so I'm in the front of the institute and I'm going to learn shortly about the bioplastics and how they are made out of bacteria. So Dr. Maciej Guzik is going to tell me everything about this process. But first, we just need to jump into the slab uniform. And now we are ready. Wow, that looks amazing. So I'll show you now uh, how we start. So we start okay. with a single bacteria. In the fridge. <laughs> so everything starts from a plate. Actually, from that little dot, which is a bacterial colony. But what are bacteria anyway? Bacteria are microscopic living organisms, which means that you can't see them. No, not even under a magnifying glass. You need a microscope to find them. And they are real survivalists. They can be found everywhere. On your skin, on plants, in water, on mountain peaks, in the desert, and even in a glaciers or in clouds. All bacteria are unicellular, and when they feel comfortable, they grow and reproduce very easily. Bacteria play quite an important role in transforming material. They provide energy, carbon, gas, oxygen, nutrients, and millions of other things that are very useful to us. Without bacteria, the earth would have no soil to grow plants. You see those little dots? Yes, These there's... are single colonies of bacteria. But they're quite small. I, I imagine that you have more bacteria to produce bioplastic. Machi really takes just one of those dots and then he feeds them. So this is how a little colony grows. We feed bacteria uh, with, let's say, sugar solution or glycerol or fatty acid. Okay, so you shake them, you, they get uh, more oxygen and they feel happy, yes? Yes. <laughs> now I'll show you the process yeah, of okay. fermentation. These are the fermenter vessels, where the bacteria are grown and the main process takes place. Here, you can control different parameters to make them feel at home. So this is a very controlled environment. You have a special vessel where you control a temperature, uh, where you control feed of oxygen. Um, and for the process that takes 30 hours, you can accumulate a lot of bacterial biomass. And inside of that biomass, there is um, bioplastic, those polyesters. Okay, wait, but where does this bioplastic suddenly come from? Well, it has to do with stress. First, the bacteria had this warm and comfy home with sufficient carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus, their favorite environment. But as soon as the supply of phosphorus and nitrogen stops, they get stressed and generate granules of polymer inside their cells. When does the stressing moment start? It is happening during the fermentation. They produce bioplastics as um, a stress-related response. So when the environment is um, harsh and they need to survive, it's like comparing them to bears. Bear prepares for winter and gathers fat. So bacteria gather fat inside within the cells as little pearls. Uh, so this is bioplastic. We will leave the bacteria in their stressed out state for a while and come later back to see how the plastic is extracted. 
So now I'm going to meet Dr. Magdalena Wojnarowska from the University of Economics in Krakow and I will talk with her about how bioeconomy addresses the challenges we have now as a society. Kluczowym zaobserwowanym przeze mnie problemem w realizacji biogospodarki jest niska świadomość społeczeństwa samej koncepcji biogospodarki, czym ona jest. Ze względu właśnie na rosnącą ilość odpadów generowanych, współcześnie powinniśmy zmienić obecnie panujący model produkcji oparty na podejściu linearnym, to jest weź, wytwórz, wyrzuć i przejść na gospodarkę o obiegu zamkniętym. Dlatego, że tylko wtedy będziemy w stanie realizować założenia biogospodarki, która jest spójna w koncepcji z ideą gospodarki o obiegu zamkniętym. So, the bioeconomy is an economy that aims to make products in a more circular way, using renewable resources that can be recycled or that are biodegradable, so it will disintegrate and be absorbed back into nature. It is also very much about reducing our consumption of fossil fuels, which causes the problematic CO2 emissions linked to global warming. Bioplastików potrzebujemy ze względu na rosnącą ilość odpadów, które nas otaczają. Aktualnie co minutę kupujemy 1 milion butelek wytwarzanych z tworzyw sztucznych. Jedynie 9% z nich jest recyklingowane, 12% spalane, natomiast reszta zalega w formie odpadów, między innymi na Pacyfiku, tworząc wyspę wielkości Francji. What? So that's why researchers like Maciej look for other ways to make plastic. Coming back to our stressed out bacteria. They are now full of pearls of polymers and will be dried and mixed with acetone. And then the resulting cocktail will be filtered. So you just told me that this is going to be the last part of the process. We are going yes. to see the plastic, yeah, exactly. aren't we? The next step that I will show you now is how the polymer crashes out from the solution. That's the plastic, isn't it? Yes, it is. What can be manufactured from this kind of material, these biopolymers? The possibilities are actually endless because this material has two great features. First of all, it's biodegradable. Uh, it means that anything made of it, let's say, one-time use cutlery or plastic bottle can be thrown into a compost and this will disintegrate within three months. So the other feature is biocompatibility. It means that material produced from those polyesters, bioplastics, is completely harmless to humans. So we can produce implants, medical devices that can come into contact with our skin, our body, or body fluids, and our organisms, they will recognize these materials are our own. Okay, so this material is also biocompatible, which is amazing because it can be used for medical purposes. But we are here in a relatively small lab. Is it efficient to produce bioplastic in that way? Can it replace current plastic? <laughs> Once we have established processes that can efficiently use resources uh, locally, then I think the price will be no longer an issue. And these polymers, they can offer so many different properties, so we can exchange nearly everything with help of polymer scientists. Definitely it's doable. So I personally feel much calmer now, knowing that researchers are already looking for solutions for the problem we have with plastics. However, by economy, it's not only about looking for new technologies, new solutions, new research, but also about changing our mindset. So I think this will be one of the biggest challenges for society in these times. For each one to realize and to think about how we can make a circular by economy, the mainstream economy of the future.
are some things in this world we just cannot change. One of them is that everyone on this planet needs food. And there is almost 8 billion of us. That's a huge amount of food. Imagine the ingredients and energy needed to cook for everyone on this planet. And we all know that at every lunch there is always something we throw away, right? But what if we used the food we throw away to make the energy we need to make more food? Hmm? In this Bloom episode, we speak about biofuel made from food waste. Would you believe me that a third of the food in Europe is thrown away? Sadly, it's true. And it's also true that all the energy that went into making the food has also gone to waste. We are here with a team of researchers who have a special gift to extract value from waste. They are going to show us how to make biofuel from all those scraps we unfortunately just throw away. We follow the concept of circular economy. Uh, in the circular economy, we want to reduce recycle and reuse waste. And when it's not possible, you need to uh, put in value this, uh, um, this, uh, this waste, producing fuel. Fossil fuel depletion is a reality, so we need to find new renewable sources of energy. How can we extract energy from the food we throw away? Hi, my name is Raquel. And in this video, I will introduce you to an exciting new way of making biofuel. Step 1. You take the food waste, you separate it from non-organic material and you blend it. Step 2. The blend is then dehydrated. Step 3. Now the dried food waste in the form of these granules is used to extract our first oil. This comes mainly from the different fats from the food, like cooking oil, fat from your burger and so on. Step 4. What is left over is mainly sugar and fibers, which is mixed with water and a fungus which has special enzymes that break down these larger molecules and gets everything ready for the next stage. Miguel Carmona Cabello talks about the commitment they have in the new research. To focus in the natural cycle and to copy this cycle in the economy. And my work here is to take this knowledge of the natural, this possibility and put in industry. How function the natural, how function the, the the environment and with this to, to take all of this knowledge, natural knowledge and applicate it in, in human knowledge. No? Step 5. The resulting liquid is filtered and fermented, which means that nature will do its work by having yeast making the oil for us. Yes, there is yeast that makes oil and with a bit of ultrasound treatment we finally get the fuel we need. Here we have the diesel and here we have the glycerin. They, they have separated they already. Can I have the diesel, this biodiesel for my car? Yes, you can use. How far fine. can I go with it? Uh, maybe with this quantity, maybe one meter. <laughs> As we just saw, this is quite a complicated process to make only a small cup of biofuel. You might think that this is not very efficient, but remember, here in the lab, everything is made on a small scale. By refining all the steps in the process, we are able to replicate it on a much larger scale at something called a biorefinery. This is where large volumes of biofuel are made. Same process, just bigger. What is a biorefinery? It's basically a huge production site that uses biomass as a primary raw material. And the cool thing is that not only do biorefineries convert biomass to energy, they also extract all the materials used to make cosmetics, animal feed and bioplastics, to name only a few. 
Here, the research that Miguel and Sara are doing is aimed at finding an efficient way to extract value from food waste as a biomass resource to convert it into biofuel and also other products. So picture this. Food waste is brought to the biorefinery. Biofuel and other things are produced, which again gives us the energy to produce more food. So, biorefineries are going to be a crucial component in any bioeconomy. I'm going to talk to Mar Delgado. She's one of the most important researchers in bioeconomy we have here at the campus in Córdoba. What is the role of biorefineries? The role is to uh, use biomass, preferably waste resources from biomass, converting into energy and also into other uh, chemical products. So it is a very important sector because we produce a lot of uh, waste biomass in Andalusia, so it's a way to adding value to these waste streams. It is still an ongoing research project, but I asked Miguel, how much food waste would I need for one liter of biodiesel? Here we see the calculations. Biomass can be a great source of energy production, But if biomass can also be used to make food directly, are we not going to be competing for resources? Are we to prioritize the fuel that machines need over food that humans need? This is a critical point. Let's hear what Mara Miguel have to say about this. So it's really nonsense to use land to produce raw materials to be burned. It's better to use the waste stream that are after producing, uh, for instance, food or animal feeding to uh, produce bioenergy. Well, a biorefinery is not only focused on making biofuel, but they can also generate a smart industry and enter into a circular economy, making new bioproducts and new processes. They also enable us to recycle or recover waste, such as waste from the agricultural and food industries and any other types of organic waste that can be used in bioprocesses. In bioeconomy, it is important to think about the social aspect as well and to make sure that there is enough food for everybody. We must consider the impact that the new bioeconomy process will have. So one idea is to use food waste, which as we saw, is a valuable source of energy. But another research project here at the University of Córdoba looks even farther into the future. This time I will visit researchers who are working with microalgae and we will hear how these magical microorganisms can create energy in the form of hydrogen. Most of us have heard about hydrogen. It has captured the attention of many researchers and there are many new technologies that will see it becoming an everyday fuel. Yet there are no natural sources of hydrogen. It has to be made or extracted. And today, more than 95% of this gas comes from fossil-based sources, which means it is not sustainable nor carbon-free because CO2 is released when it is produced. But a small percentage comes from natural or renewable resources such as wind or solar energy. This is known as green hydrogen. And, as we will see in this video, our tiny friends microalgae are experts in making hydrogen. We are working with one microalgae which is able to produce hydrogen. It's able to use the sunlight and use that energy to produce hydrogen. But let me briefly explain what microalgae are. 
Microalgae are like the algae we can see when we go to the beach, but just much, much smaller. But they grow very quickly thanks to the huge amounts of CO2 they consume. You can think of them as little bioreactors that produce a lot of good stuff. And besides, they are extremely flexible and can adapt to many situations. They can even live in polluted water and, as they grow, make the water less polluted. Microalgae can produce different kinds of biofuels. For example, biodiesel from accumulation of lipids, bioethanol. Uh, very interesting also, they produce hydrogen. Hydrogen is a different kind of a biofuel, which is 100% clean. It's supposed to be the biofuels of the future. For me, it's very uh, interesting and exciting to see that uh, a unicellular, very small cell, uh, is able to use the sunlight, just water and CO2 to, to produce hydrogen. So it's, it's a very uh, easy way to, to get a biofuel. What would it happen if I drink something of this microalgae? It would be a great experiment, but I am not going to taste it. The green stuff is the microalgae and they release an invisible gas, which is hydrogen. Microalgae are photosynthetic organisms and they're able to harness the solar energy mm -hmm. and fix CO2. And this allows a process of uh, electron transfer within the cell that uh, with proton is able at the end to produce hydrogen. There are different ways to make this gas. The research is about finding the optimal conditions to make the process really efficient. The researchers here are working with a combination of freshwater algae and a specific bacteria which are able to produce hydrogen too. In the growing room they control a variety of parameters. They first grow the microalgae for a few days and then trigger the hydrogen production process. Neda Fakhimi shows us how you can test the result, the amount of hydrogen. So we count the amount of each component in this amount of mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. head space. So, here we now have hydrogen, but is it ready to be used as fuel for transport? Yes, it can be stored in a tank and be used in electric cars equipped with fuel cells. In these fuel cells, hydrogen is used to produce electricity, which then powers the car. As David said before, hydrogen itself is 100% clean because it does not have any CO2 emissions. Simply put, when this gas reacts with oxygen, it produces two things, electricity and water. So, hydrogen is a zero-emission fuel that will propel cars, trucks, trains and even planes and rockets. It is very important for many industries too. To find out more about the future of this fuel, the Bloom team spoke to hydrogen expert Horst Steinmüller from the Austrian Research and Development Center on Renewable Gases called BIFA. Hydrogen will be one of the solutions for a carbon-free economy because you can use hydrogen in different kind of, of our industrial life. You can use it as fuel in cars or ships. You can use it as reduction medium in the industry, but you can also use it as storage material. If you want really to decarbonize our, our economy, then, the, then this hydrogen has to come from renewable sources. Otherwise, if you stick to, to the fossil, you will not take, decarbonize it. So, the research in Córdoba is to bring about efficiency needed for the microalgae to produce lots of hydrogen, so that it becomes an important source of green hydrogen, just like the one we get from wind, water and solar power. Thanks, microalgae! And it's nature engineered that on its own. Imagine what the future would look like.
billions of microalgae living in large tanks and giving us the gift of hydrogen and many other sustainable materials. And it is even possible that they will help us clean polluted water during this process. If your wishes come true, what does it look like? We are not going to grow the algae just for hydrogen production. We are going to use algae for many different things. We can produce cosmetics, we can do bioremediation, we can produce other biofuels. So it will be like a multifactory. And that is what bioeconomy is about, to make optimal use of a natural resource and to close the loops between what we produce and what we consume. So join us for a bioeconomy future. Perhaps the next pass you take might use fuel that is made by nature. Stay updated on how Bloom is engaging EU citizens and civil society in the bioeconomy and how you can get involved via the project website and social media, www.bloom-bioeconomy.eu.